Good morning, Good everyone. morning, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to, to Leipzig. Leipzig. I hear myself, I hear myself there. there. Thanks. Thanks, Angelo. Angelo. Welcome, to, Welcome Leipzig. to Leipzig. Welcome to Leipzig. Semantics uh, 2023. We are very excited and happy to have you here. We worked really hard to build a very nice program for all of you, and uh, we hope that uh, you will enjoy it. Um, so uh, another welcome from you, Christoph, maybe. Go ahead. Thank you. So um, I would also take this opportunity to welcome the members of LTI, uh, our friends from Semantic, um, honorable guests, and um, everybody else. So welcome today. Last but not least, uh, welcome from me as well, Annalisa Gentile from IBM Research. And, you know, we, we work together to put uh, a good program, hopefully, for you, and we hope you enjoy it. Um, if you find any of these people around, thank them. Uh, it's been a great team. Um, we, as general chair, did little in, with respect to what all these people uh, put together. And a big, big thank you to all the sponsors. Nothing happens without their, their support. Uh, so go check the exhibition outside. They'll have demos for you and amazing stuff for you to, um, you know, to look at. And let me probably take this opportunity to thank you very much for all the hard work that you have put into it. We, we know that uh, organizing conferences is a lot of work so that the coffee is outside, the video is working, and the microphones are working, most, most importantly. So thank you very much. Thank you. So as a chairman of uh, LT Innovate, uh, the language technology industry group, um, our task is to promote uh, language technology uh, in Brussels, um, around the world. Uh, we present white papers, um, and uh, we're working uh, together with others on, on books and positional papers in order to drive forward the language technology uh, industry. And um, we are very happy always to work together with, uh, with not only industry, but also with academia uh, in order to move forward uh, quickly. Next page. Um, <clears throat> we are um, founded uh, quite some time ago. Um, we, this is our 10th uh, conference, and this is another conference that we do together with Semantics. So we are particularly happy that uh, this is happening and that we can greet so many people here tonight. Um, not only tonight, uh, these two days. Um, <clears throat> let me probably um, come to um, uh, the one word that we will hear most prominently over the next two days, and that is large language models. Um, I thought that uh, maybe we should uh, come up with a sort of a drinking game. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, with water, of course. Uh, so, uh, I, I would presume that we are all very well hydrated if we all take a sip of water every, every time somebody mentions uh, large language models. But on a serious note, um, let, me, let me walk back uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, uh, when, uh, when I started my career uh, over at IBM Research, and um, back then, I, I had the honor to, to meet Fred Jelinek. And uh, Fred Jelinek was, if you like, one of the founders of, of, of language models. And back in the days, there was a big discussion going on between the people who would build speech recognition grammars to reduce perplexity, and those people who would use bigram or trigram language models <clears throat> in order to predict the probability of a certain word in the context of other words, so when I say things like, good morning, ladies, and your built-in language model says the next word would probably be gentleman, and that is exactly what Fred Jelinek, you know, implemented in terms of software. And um, so there was these two groups, uh, the one, one kind of people working on, on, the, on these huge grammars and, and, and the others that would work on, um, you know, training with lots of training data, those, those language models. And uh, it all culminated that at some point Jelinek says, every time I fire a linguist, my system gets better. <clears throat> so with this spark um, for uh, the next two days, um, I hand over to the lovely ladies uh, to please uh, take over from here. Thank you.
Okay, as everyone uh, following semantics history knows that semantics is uh, um, going around uh, certain five cities so far, and uh, Vienna, Amsterdam, Ghent, uh, Leipzig. Um, this year is, uh, of course, our turn in Leipzig, and uh, we are hosting here, uh, you here. We are very happy. Semantics uh, generally has been focusing on transfer engineering community. This year, uh, we had the theme of uh, decentralized knowledge ecosystems, but after having the submissions, it's like knowledge graphs, machine learning, uh, coming together with language uh, uh, technologies. Um, we will. Uh, we are. We, we look forward to get also your feedback about the uh, program, um, and um, of course uh, the the program at a glance. If if we. Uh, give a quick overview. Yesterday, uh, already the pre-conference day kicked off and we had the Wikipedia day, we had workshops and tutorial. Um, was a, a great um, uh, keynote by um, Edward Corey. Um, you see the pictures from yesterday and today, first conference day and of course tomorrow. I will not uh, bore you with the numbers there, but uh, I would like to just mention that we have 40, over 40 presentations, talks, uh, exhibitions, as Annalisa mentioned, please go around. Uh, we also have uh, sponsorship talks and um, a panel tomorrow, which we invite all of you to attend. Um, to access the uh, program, you have the QR code and the link um, that is accessible from the um, website of the conference. And we are having a color-coded, uh, because we have different types of uh, talks, we have uh, color-coded that. And yesterday, um, to just say, I, I mentioned it, we had a very inspiring talk and uh, the topic was towards foundation models for data spaces by Edward and uh, for tomorrow onwards, or today. And, you know, Today and tomorrow we have a packed program. Let me just highlight the keynotes and the invited speakers. I am so excited for all of that. Um, and you'll see more. We'll, we'll talk more about names and introduction and so on. But look at the faces again. You'll see them around. Go to the next slide. Again, um, some of the keynotes are from LT Innovate and some are from Semantics. Go talk to all of them. Be inspired by their talk and you'll see more. Um, a couple of things we really wanted to highlight because it's like something, some innovation that we brought this year. One thing is, um, so this is semantics conference. So we brought in the knowledge graph. Um, you see Danny, uh, Daniel Garijo uh, at the corner there. He's been putting together a knowledge graph for, for the conference. You can download it, query, and it's all available. It's all linked. We collected all resources, all you know, identifier for resources. Anyone who put papers, codes, anything at all in the paper has been um, you know, extracted and available for you, for you to query. One more thing, um, there is uh, Melissa Machure, she's uh, connected online and she'll be drawing live uh, for all the invited speakers, for keynote speakers and for the research track papers. Um, all these will be um, you know, released while the conference uh, go on. Uh, so check our Twitter, check all our social media. Angelo is uh, Angelo, Julia, Christina, they're all tweeting about it. And everything will be in the knowledge graph. So um, all released by you know, permissive licenses. Uh, so back to submissions, uh, we could, uh, uh, schematically, we could uh, divide them into cultural heritage. You will hear from provenance and compliance, reasoning and recommendation, NLP, LLMs, of course, uh, legal data governance and finance, knowledge graphs and data management and more. Uh, we are also very happy uh, that we got 56 submissions and 16 um, accepted uh, research and innovation papers. Uh, the rest of the statistics I leave for you to read, <laughs> maybe later. We will have award sessions tomorrow in the closing, and uh, we have different types of um, award uh, uh, types. Um, and we are having a very good a jury of at least five people, and we will all attending the... Um, talks and uh, we will be having a very democratic voting system for this. Um, please also schedule to join the closing session. We have exciting news there as well. And our proceedings, we have to thank to our uh, proceeding chair who was the general chair for 18 years in semantics, Tassilo. 
um, and uh, the proceeding uh, is iOS, and we also uh, have the workshop uh, papers in, I don't know how people pronounce, but I say CoreWS, but I don't know, it's like have different <laughs> or cure. So anyway, um, we, want to, we wanted to have an instruction um, a slide, but we said our instruction is Angelo Salitoni, so um, remember his face. If you have problems, please run to him. We, we are putting you in trouble. But he has the, only yesterday, and I think today morning already, has the record of steps uh, running uh, around the building. He managed all the uh, live streams yesterday himself, going from one room to another. He has a team today, and uh, we would like to thank him for all the work he's doing. Um, this QR code, yes, please. And the QR code is for the uh, instructions he built uh, uh, and uh, put uh, uh, for all of us accessible um, to know how to attend the live stream and all the other... Um, oh, we have some bullet points there. But the most important thing I want to highlight is that if you want to use your own laptop, we will not exchange the laptop. You have to join a live stream and then uh, share a screen from there. So this will be the most important thing to know. Once more, thanks for everyone being here, for the sponsors, for uh, the team, uh, for the organizers. But without you, the conference would not happen. So now we need to clap for you. Thanks for being here, audience, and we look forward to talk and chat. So, hi everyone, I'm Julia Holzer, I'm the local chair of this year's Semantics, and we would like to introduce this guy to you. So, the, <clears throat> the Saxon Minister of Science has sent us a message of greeting. He is responsible for science and research. Unfortunately, he cannot be here with us today, but he sends us his wishes and well, greetings, and yeah, he prepared a video, so let's watch this. Angelo, please start the video. Dear Chairman Professor Franschik, distinguished scientists, representatives from industry and business, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the Semantics and Language Intelligence Conference. Conferences like Semantics and Language Intelligence promote and strengthen the dialogue between scientists and representatives from industry and business. I am very pleased and grateful that institutions centered on knowledge exchange such as the Institute for Applied Computer Science and Affiliate Institute at Leipzig University are acting as links between science and business and have set about organizing conferences like this one. Leipzig is an education hub and host of many important conferences. It held a semantics conference as early as 2016. The Leipzig region offered a science-friendly environment and an excellent education system, as well as investment capital for spin-off companies. The Saxon state government is welcoming and supporting the exchange and transfer between science and business in a variety of ways. The state's universities, technical colleges and research institutes have been developing innovations of the future which can now be presented to potential employers. To ensure that knowledge about the capabilities of Saxony as a science location is shared and that people are infected by our enthusiasm, my ministry has launched the SPIN 2030 campaign and with SPIN 2030 we also want to raise general awareness of the essential importance of scientific findings. These science-based ideas are crucial for ensuring our economy remains productive and therefore for developing our wealth and future-proofing our state. Artificial intelligence is an essential topic in view of the future and one that will fundamentally change and shape the way we live and work. The aim here is to be among the top players, to help pave the way forward and to then utilize these new possibilities in a way that is profitable for society, business and industry and which benefits everyone. That's why I'm so happy to see the positive international response to this conference. Renowned 
esteemed members of the AI community from Chile, Great Britain and the USA have traveled to Saxony and will now be able to explore this innovation hub for themselves. Ambitious international scientists working with knowledge graphs and artificial intelligence will be able to make contact with international companies like Siemens, Bosch, IBM and Meta and present their research results. This is how long-term corporations and an international network are forged. So I invite you to spend the next two days learning about AI and its applications and about the latest advancements and innovations in this field. There's a wide range of exciting presentations, demos and poster sessions for you to attend. I wish you many lively and productive discussions and great inspiration for new ideas. And if you still have some free time away from the conference, I hope you also enjoy exploring our beautiful and vibrant city of Leipzig. Thank you very much. A warm welcome to you all. Dear Chairman Professor so, Franci, distinguished very scientists. Much. As I said, he sent us his greetings and best wishes, and now I will hand over to Annalisa and then our next keynote speaker. Thank you. So, this one concludes our welcoming. I hope you are inspired. And now I am extremely inspired and humbled that Luna accepted our invitation to uh, speak at this conference. So Luna is, um, I'm a big fan. Um, she is one of the person, if you think about knowledge graph, she's one of the person to talk to. She has been working with major companies. So she started with many years ago with data integration. She comes from you know data integration world, but then she did the Google knowledge uh, vault. And then she went on to Amazon. And probably you all using, when you search, you're all using her technology. Um, and now she's a principal uh, research at uh, Meta Reality Lab. Um, Luna is, um, let me, I'm going to take um, a couple of uh, my notes, um, but she has uh, many, uh, many awards, including, um, you know, uh, the um, Early Career Research Contribution Award for advancing the state of the art on knowledge fusion, of course. Um, she has been awarded, um, she's a distinguished uh, ACM member. She serves on many program committees, um, especially VLDB, P VLDB, um, v, um, WSDM, um, SIGMOD, all of anything related with Knowledge Graph, um, she's, uh, she's involved. Uh, I think there's no further ado, and I'm going to leave this stage to her. And thank you again for accepting our invitation. You all hear me OK? So there are a lot of seats at the front. And for people standing at the back of the room, please feel free to come to find a seat. There are also seats here. OK, uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm Luna from Meta, and it is my great pleasure and honor to come here to talk about my work on knowledge graphs in the past decade. So before we talk about knowledge graph, let me first tell you a little bit about myself. So I got my PhD from uh, University of Washington in Seattle. And then I moved to uh, Google for at the end of my PhD for one year to do an internship. After that, I started my first uh, job at at and Labs as a pure researcher. And then I moved, let me see. Ooh. So, okay. So then I moved back to Google uh, to, uh, as, to do uh, both research and production. And then I moved back to uh, Seattle, uh, first working at Amazon and recently working at Meta. Again, both doing research and production. So I call this my salmon path. 
And in this journey, I have built three knowledge graphs. The first one is related to my PhD thesis. It's a personal knowledge graph to do personal information management. And the second one is at Google, when we do Google knowledge graphs to support search. And the third one is at Amazon for product knowledge graph to support uh, product e-business like search recommendation, detail page, and so on. Now at Meta, we are still working with public and private knowledge graphs to support smart assistants. I will tell you more later. So um, the second thing about me is um, uh, my favorite quote is that science is to test the crazy ideas. Engineering is to bring these ideas into business. And this is because since graduation, I have been working in industry for the past like 15 years uh, to do research and production. And my uh, research philosophy is that we should shoot both for roof shot goals and moonshot goals. Roof shot goals allow us to deliver incrementally and also make the production impacts, whereas we also need to shoot for moonshot goals because otherwise we will see the uh, ceiling very soon. And so we need to invent the state of the art. So this comes to the two themes for this talk. The first theme is the three generations of knowledge graphs. And here, uh, the first generation is entity-based knowledge graphs, such as Google generic knowledge graphs, DBpedia. Uh, the second one is text-rich knowledge graphs, such as the Amazon product knowledge graph, and I will tell you more about why it is text-rich. And recently, with the large language models, uh, we call it do neural knowledge graphs, and I will tell you more. So the second theme is, what is the recipe to go from innovation to practice to connect the dots between the crazy ideas and the real business impact? Uh, some of you might be from uh, academia, and you might be uh, wondering about this. And I call this from zero to one trillion. And so the first step is from zero to one. And this is to come up with some crazy idea and to test the feasibility. And this could be through a demo, through um, a set of experiments, and could result with a paper. And then from one to a thousand, this is about nailing down the quality so we can provide some decent, delightful user experiences for some end-to-end um, -end minimum viable product uh, experiences. And so quality is the key to lead to the production. And the next stage from 1,000 to 1 million, and this is uh, repeatability. So maybe we have the success in one domain, and can we repeat it to see it for multiple domains? And this is often through some end-to-end -end pipelines, some automation, so we can extend to broader impact. And the next stage from 1 uh, million to 1 billion, I call it scalability. And this is a time we want to invent new technologies to significantly reduce the cost and to scale up. Keep in mind that we cannot achieve scalability by repeating. Scalability oftentimes requires new technology. And finally, ubiquity. Can we maximize the coverage? Can we really cover all of the long tail use cases? Can we remove all of the assumptions we made at the beginning when we came up with the solutions? So we want the technique to be able to cover everything and really maximize the impact. Oops, sorry. And so the ubiquity and similar for scalability, oftentimes they will lead to the next cycle of uh, innovation. 
So coming back to the roof shot goals and the moonshot goals, oftentimes quality and repeatability is the roof shot goals, which allows us to uh, production. And then scalability and ubiquity are the moonshot goals, which lead to the next cycle of innovation. And how about from zero to one? That is very, very important. And that is the starting point. But just getting the feasibility tested does not by itself already promise uh, that much of the impact. So that's a very important first step, but it needs the follow-up steps to lead to impact. Okay, so now let's get started to talk about the different generations of the knowledge graphs and use that to demonstrate the different phrases. The first generation is entity-based knowledge graphs. So it is a graph, it has nodes, and edges. Each node represents an entity which belongs to one or multiple entity types, and each uh, edge represents the relationship between the entities. For example, this is a song, and it has the same artist and songwriter whose name is Taylor Swift. And uh, there are two characteristics for entity-based knowledge graphs. Uh, one is that the ontology are typically manually defined, including the entity types and the relationships. And um, it, it has like very uh, clear semantics. And the second, the entities are typically named entities, and uh, they have clear boundaries. Even if there is another Xin Luna Dong standing beside me, it is a different person, and so we still need to be represented using two different nodes in the knowledge graph. And the crazy idea behind the entity-based knowledge graph is to create a graph of entities and uh, relationships to um, represent to sort of uh, mimic the way human beings view the real world. Okay, so now the question becomes how can we identify the entities and relationships? And for those people who learned database courses, it often started with something called the ER diagram. ER means entity and relationship. So uh, naturally, the structured data and the semi-structured data, they are natural sources to collect knowledge. And turns out, the first part of gold uh, for knowledge graph is from Wikipedia. And here I'm showing you a Wikipedia info box for Taylor Swift. And we can see that it's fairly easy to extract the structured attributes and relationships from the info box to build the knowledge graph. So this is the first step for feasibility. And how about the quality? Luckily, Wikipedia has fairly high uh, quality for the data. And as such, uh, we easily uh, obtained uh, this production quality and it soon becomes common practice in industry. So early uh, knowledge graphs, as a lot of us are very familiar with uh, here, is includes like um, uh, DBpedia, Yago, Freebase, and the all of these three released their data in the year of 2007. And in the year of 2012, we see like a Google Knowledge Graph, Microsoft, Satori, et cetera, um, launched uh, for web search. Okay, so, so far so good. Can we repeat the success to get data from other data sources. And so certainly we can have some tool to help people collect knowledge from uh, different sources. And um, this will allow us to avoid writing every single uh, line of code to do all of this. But now we have some uh, challenges. The f if we look at this too, one from uh, IMDB and one from Wikidata, and um, uh, do we know if they are the same person? And uh, if we look at this born and the date of birth, do we know if they are the same attribute? 
And also we found that uh, one birthday is different from another one. Is this beautiful lady like uh, born twice or one of these birthdays are correct? And all of this represent the heterogeneity uh, challenge in terms of entity level, uh, value level, and also attribute level. And so the solution here, sorry, the, the, the format is a little different after we do the transformation uh, from uh, Google presentation to uh, these uh, slides. And so here what it says is that the solution is data integration. So all of these techniques, entity linkage, is um, invented to uh, address the heterogeneity at the entity level. And the schema alignment technique is used to address heterogeneity at the attribute level. And the data fusion is invented to address the heterogeneity at the value level. And so uh, data integration is basically an important way to integrate data with heterogeneity. To just to tell you a little bit about entity linkage, where we need to decide if entities from the different data sources actually represent the same real world entity. So we create a single node in the knowledge graph for that entity. So after years of uh, practice and trying, we found that just by like uh, tree-based machine learning models, such as uh, like random forest, we can already get very good results. And uh, if we look at these results, where we try to link movies and the people from Freebase and IMDb, and using the tree-based models, uh, taking the attribute similarity as the uh, the, the, the features, we are able to obtain very, very high precision recall. And this is the PR curve, precision recall curve. And honestly, this is the best shape of PR curve I have ever seen in my career. Uh, the issue here is that to achieve these good results, we need about 1.5 million of labels, and that's a lot. If we reduce the number of labels to one, uh, 15K, uh, which is about 1% of the labels, then precision still maintains at 99%, but the, the recall will drop from 99% to 95%. And even for 15K labels, this would require 30 labelers to label for one week if they got trained and are very, very efficient. And now the question is, how can we speed this up? And so we used, um, oops. So we use the active learning, and this allows us to choose what kind of labels we need, and we are able to reduce the number of labels to by two orders of magnitude. And as you can see, now we use less labels to achieve the same level of precision recall. Okay, so this is just a one example for data integration. But let's look at the next. So how can we scale this up? How can we get knowledge from all of the, all of the uh, web on the structured data? So there is a kind of uh, uh, websites called semi-structured websites. And as you can see, uh, we have the attribute value pairs in those websites and they kind of are generated from some underlying structure data. And they become very good source for knowledge collection. But here, because there could be a lot of data sources, such data sources on the web, so just the manually doing the transformation, even with the help of some tools, is still not feasible. And what we do is uh, we want to now do data extraction. And the key, uh, to the success of knowledge extraction is uh, two part. One is we apply distance supervision. So because everything needs to be automatic, so we generate the training data automatically. What we do is we compare uh, 
page like this with the data we already have in the knowledge graph. If there is overlapping data, that is what we use to generate the training data. And by distance supervision, we can automate everything. The second key is that if we look at those pages, uh, we can easily tell as human beings that this is an attribute and this is a value. And even for those of you who do not understand Chinese, you can still tell like this is the attribute and this is the value. And so we try to uh, mine from the layout of the web pages, and we generate graphs uh, according to the layout from each web page. When we applied graph neural net uh, to reason about the layout, and that's how we uh, train models to do knowledge extraction. Just to give you some uh, flavor of the results, we extract from sampled pages from a more than 30 long tail uh, movie websites. And as you can see, for closed IE extraction, meaning extracting knowledge for the attributes, we have training, uh, training data in the, uh, in the uh, existing knowledge graph. We can see that this is where we get, and by applying a threshold, we can get 90% precision, which allows us to do production using the extracted data. And this is supporting, for example, like Amazon um, Alexa knowledge graph. And then for open knowledge extraction, meaning we extract knowledge for new attributes, which we haven't seen in existing taxonomy or ontology, or even for new domains, and we get um, much more knowledge, knowledge facts, but on the other hand, the quality is lower. If we only look at the new attributes, it's even like uh, lower here. So this shows the promise, but on the other hand, we still need more work to bring it up to the production level. Okay, ubiquity. Can we extract knowledge from the whole web? And uh, this comes to the Knowledge Vault project we did at Google. And what we did is we extract knowledge not only from semi-structured websites, but also from web texts, from web tables, the tabular data on the web, and the annotations in the HTML files, HTML code, according to, for example, schema.org. And using uh, we applied 16 different extractors to extract the knowledge, and then we applied knowledge fusion to decide which extracted fact is correct and which is not. And this uh, allows us to extract from 2.5 billions of URLs, web pages, and generate 3.2 billions of knowledge triples, and identify about 10% of them that are high uh, confidence or are high likely to be correct. And then we generate a prob probabilistic knowledge graph based on that. So there are limitations for knowledge vault, and the uh, extraction didn't go into Google Knowledge Graph for two reasons. First, if we just look at the high confidence, accuracy equals 70%, it is still not that high. And Google Knowledge Graph actually asks for 99% accuracy. And that's why we trust uh, the data shown on the knowledge panels. And the second, we can apply a higher threshold to get 99% accuracy, but that does not give us that much of uh, uh, knowledge facts. And this is so long tail for existing entities, so it does not support extra like um, uh, MVP experiences. However, the underlying techniques are still applied at Google and later on at other companies as well to collect long tail knowledge. Okay. To uh, summarize for entity-based KG, so the crazy idea here is to build a graph of entities and relationships to represent the real world. And the main challenge is we have heterogeneous data everywhere. And to uh, collect knowledge, we do transformation from structure sources, we do web extraction, and then we do entity linkage 
to link the entities that represent the same real world entity, we achieved a very high precision recall. And um, we do knowledge fusion to decide the correctness of the extracted knowledge. All of this gives us a good knowledge graph, which can be used to generate more training data for a web extraction. And this has been used for web search, for web question answering, and also for smart assistants. So as we have talked about uh, ubiquity, another question we have is, can we cover the long tail use cases? One of the long tail use cases for Google as an example is actually product search. And this leads to the next generation, the text reach knowledge graphs. Okay, so for here is an example for product knowledge graph. And as you can see, we have a deep and a rich taxonomy. And also for the products, we have attribute values for flavor, for color, et cetera. And oftentimes the attribute values are uh, texts. And this can be applied in many other domains as well, such as bioinformatics, geography, uh, health, and so on. So there are three characteristics for text-rich knowledge graph. Uh, one is uh, the ontology can be very, very rich and complex. Oftentimes, there can be some overlaps between the, source, uh, between the types. For example, two-piece swimming suit and fashionable swimming suits, and uh, they are actually overlapping types. And the second character is that the attribute values, they can be just the text, and there are very like a vague boundary between different text values. For example, coffee flavored ice cream and cappuccino flavored ice cream, are they say the same? Are they different? It's very subtle to tell. And finally, the product entities, they are not named entities. So if we look at this product name, it is very different from my name. And you can see this product name is actually a concatenation of attribute values. So the crazy idea here is with all of the complexity, can we still mine the structure and model all of the ambiguities from the text sources? There are uh, many different applications for the product structure data. And here we show the attribute, val uh, attribute value pairs uh, in a structured form so it is easy for the uh, shoppers to understand. Uh, and also we can show them for easy selections of the, uh, to, to make the choices when you do shopping. We can use this for search. For example, if you search cake cups, Dunkin' Donuts, dark, uh, we, uh, at a point, Amazon still like, um, uh, return uh, the dark roasted, uh, the, the medium roasted coffee, and also different brands. And if, if we understand the semantics better, we can return all of the coffee that satisfy the user's needs. And finally, we can do recommendations. For example, for this mixer, we can show you mixers of uh, higher <coughs> capacity, uh, more attachments, different brands, so on and so forth, to explain to you why we make those recommendations. So I guess at this point you're wondering, yes, this looks good, but do we need new techniques? We have developed a whole lot of techniques for entity-based knowledge collection. And yes, so if I show you uh, this page, for a typical like um, a product detail page. You can see the difference from the pages I showed you before. For entity-based knowledge, we, can, we have plenty of structured data sources to collect the knowledge. But for product and also some other domains, we have uh, mainly like 
um, text information instead of structured information. And even if we do have some of the structured information, it may not be correct. And if you look at the size, look at the flavor, I bet that is different from what you are expecting. So unstructured and noisy uh, product, product data, this is a challenge we are facing. And so we developed this auto know project at Amazon. And uh, this is a self-driving product knowledge collection. Again, it is uh, uh, mostly automatic. And uh, we start from the uh, Amazon data, including a taxonomy, manually crafted, and also a, a catalog with uh, products, their types, and a whole bunch, of a whole bunch of attributes. Some of them are missing, some of them are incorrect. And then meanwhile, we have the user log for view, for purchase, et cetera. And then, then we enrich it to the product knowledge graph by identifying new product types, uh, such as here, Prezel. And uh, we correct the uh, wrong values, and we also identify the new values for the products. So OK, let's see what's the key technology behind it. Recall that the product entities are not named entities. And so here, from the product names, we can actually identify a lot of attribute values. And we can see the form of those detergents, the scent of the detergents. So what we want to do is to uh, extract oops, those uh, attribute values from the product names, descriptions, bullets, and so on. And how is this different from entity-based knowledge extraction? So if we look at um, this example, Bill Gates founded Microsoft in this particular year. And uh, for entity-based knowledge extraction, we first identify the two entities, Bill Gates and Microsoft. And then we decide what is the relationship between the entities according to the text there. And um, for products, on the other hand, there is good news that we do not need to identify the subject. The subject entity is the product. Um, uh, but on the other hand, for the objects, uh, they are not named entities. It's a whole bunch of phrases. And so we need to do the phrase extraction. So what we did, uh, this is uh, about like, um, uh, seven years ago, uh, what we did is this uh, BIOE extraction. And so, for example, for this product, we want to extract the flavors. Beef meal is a flavor, so beef is tagged as B, beginning of the flavor. Meal is tagged as E, ending of the flavor. And for ranch raised lamb, similarly, ranch is the beginning, raised is inside, and lamb is end of the uh, flavor. So for recipe and end, these are outside the particular phrases or flavors. So this is the so-called BIOE tagging. And what we did is a four-layer model. We take the word embedding as the input to capture the semantics of each token. And then we do by our SDM to capture the sequence information. And then, of course, we apply the attention to identify the important terms that lead to the attribute values. And then we applied conditional random form to capture the correlations of the BIOE tags. For example, ending E should come after B beginning. OK, so this gives us uh, reasonably good results. And we see that uh, by adding all of the layers, we get the best results. And also, we are able to extract not only the values we have seen, but new values we have never seen in the training data. And so we obtained the quality something like between 85% and 90%. 
And this is good, but not good enough. And in production, we need at least 90% of the accuracy. And what we did here is basically to put an army of people around it. So we have our taxonomists and uh, other people, like PMs, TPMs, to help us understand the domain and the, the attributes and generate a lot of training data. And then uh, we train and fine tune the models. And the model, by the way, is called OpenTag. And after that, we do post-processing to filter those wrong extractions. And the post-processing rules are often manually uh, decided. And finally, we do some pre-publishing evaluation to make sure we only publish correct data to the product knowledge graph. So that's a lot of work. And this still gives us the production quality. The next question is how to repeat this for, uh, to extract knowledge for different types of products and attributes. And what we did is to basically replace or automate each step one by one. And for training data generation, we used weak learning, again, distance supervision, to leverage the data from the catalogs so we can generate the training data to automate this. Because the catalog data can be noisy, so we also uh, uh, generate the benchmarking so we can often refer to it to understand the quality. For the post-processing, we use the deep learning data cleaning to identify the wrong extractions. And so after that, for the remaining uh, mistakes, we might still do a little bit of a, a sort of a manual rule-based post-processing. But oftentimes, it's very, very much work. And then for pre-publishing evaluation, we improved it so we can reduce the number of uh, evaluation data needed to evaluate the accuracy of the data, whereas still have the statistical significance. And finally, we built the AutoML pipeline, and so we are able to remove the PhDs from the cycle and just have our data associates or contractors to train and fine tune the model. So this allows us to put this into the uh, pipeline and uh, generate a lot of uh, uh, product, clean product knowledge. Okay, so I will skip the details here. And now let's look at scalability. And uh, actually, in the product domain, we could have millions of different product types. And we could have thousands of attributes and also hundreds of languages. If we want to train the model for every cell here, it is still so many models to train. And so what I said is good, but can still not like uh, scale up to so many different, such a big space. And what we did is a one-size-fits-all model. And basically, we tried to train one model for many, many different uh, types or many different attributes. And you might ask, yeah, but this sounds natural. It is not necessarily that natural. So if we look at the TV set and the T set, and if you just look at the attribute value, it has very different vocabulary, very different text pattern. And you might think, oh yeah, that's true. One is uh, electronics, one is food. I'm sure I can get like 10 big buckets and then train 10 models to cover them. But now let's look at the tea and the coffee. These are two types that are sibling types in this big taxonomy. But if we look at the size, it is still very different vocabulary and a very different text pattern. And so what we need here is one way that we can handle all of this heterogeneity or this variety. So just to give you a very high level idea of how we do this, so basically we take the product types as part of the uh, input and use the embedding there to uh, sort of uh, to condition the attention. And also, instead of just uh, like extracting the values, we also predict the categories. 
This allows us, this kind of multitask learning allows us to understand the uh, uh, sort of uh, text tokens that lead us to the categories and be sensitive to it in the models. Okay, so that gives us this scale up. And only till this step, we are able to cover a lot of different types uh, for Amazon product data. And finally, ubiquity. So can we get very high coverage? Can we get the knowledge also from, for example, image data and also from like uh, review data and so on? And here to show you one example, if we want to tell what is the product form of this uh, product, if we just look at the product title, it says stick, it says cream, it says uh, other stuff, which is very confusing. But once we look at the image, the shape tells us, yes, it is stick. And also the text here also says stick. And this allows us to mine more knowledge and to improve the quality of the knowledge we collect. And as here we shows, this multimodal knowledge extraction is able to uh, achieve the best precision and recall. Uh, without the image, without the OCR text extraction from the, uh, the image, we get worse uh, results, lower uh, quality. Okay. So to summarize uh, the crazy idea here between, uh, behind the text-rich knowledge graph is to find the structure and the modeling uh, ambiguity from the text-rich sources. And the main challenge is the sparse and noisy structure data we have uh, from the e-business websites. And uh, our framework is that we take the catalog and then we do knowledge extraction and imputation to in significantly increase the coverage of the knowledge. And then we apply knowledge cleaning to increase the accuracy of the data. And the applications here uh, include product detail, display, uh, search, recommendation. And as an example, this um, gave us like um, uh, more than uh, kind of uh, hundreds of millions of um, dollars increase the revenue for Amazon every year. Some unmentioned uh, crazy idea is to automatically extract and mine the taxonomy, the big like uh, taxonomy from the products uh, web pages. Okay, so now next generation. And uh, what is the next generation? And I guess at this moment, a lot of you actually have the question in your mind, will the large language models replace knowledge graphs with all of the glory of the large language models? How many of you have asked yourself this question? Yes, a lot of you. And this is not surprising. I have been asked this question like a lot of times in the first half of this year. And so to figure it out, I asked the GPT-4, uh, tell me about famous people named Michael Jordan. And certainly it gives me uh, different answers every time. But the first time I asked it, uh, it actually gave me the best answer. It told me Michael Jordan, the basketball, uh, basketball player, the actor, and also the researcher. The facts here are mostly correct, except that it is more than five MVP awards. It's amazing results. So next I asked, um, tell me famous people named Xin Luna Dong. And uh, it also gives very reasonable results. And honestly, uh, given that it admits I'm a famous person, I possibly would accept whatever answer it provides. But I still become greedy, and I ask, tell me, famous people named Luna Dong. And it is reasonable answer. It does not mention anything about knowledge graph. It's a little disappointing, but I still accept it. And how about famous people named Xin Dong? This time, GPT got really uh, upset and impatient and said, no, 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 I don't know this person. <laughs> so I also asked, tell me famous books for knowledge graphs. And it gives me seven answers. Uh, the first one is actually uh, a workshop. And um, 
the rest are books. The second and third one have wrong author names. And uh, the next three have uh, either missing author or wrong ordering of the authors. And the last one is almost right. And so at this point, we were asking ourselves, how knowledgeable are large language models? And in particular, we ask us three sub-questions. How reliable are large language models in answering factual questions? And uh, does, do the large language models perform equally well for different kinds of knowledge? And finally, for the well-known large language model tricks, such as uh, increasing the model size, instruction tuning, do they help in terms of getting more factual information? So uh, there are two enablers to allow us to do the study. The first one is a benchmark, which we call head to tail. So in this benchmark, we have three specific domains. Uh, each one, we get about 3,000 questions. And also, we have the open domain where we use the DBpedia data, and we collected 9,000 questions. And in total, we have 18,000 questions. In addition, just to tell you a bit about the questions, we basically generate the templates according to the attributes. And uh, we have uh, like uh, almost 400 different templates for DBpedia, as you could imagine, because it is very rich. The reason we call it head to, tell, head to tail is because uh, we look at the distribution of the data. And if we use the popularity uh, to measure uh, the, the, the uh, kind of uh, whether the entities are head or tail, uh, basically we can see that the majority of the entities are actually long tail. To tell you a little bit more how we distinguish head, torso, tail, basically we rank the entities by the popularity, for example, the citations, the ratings, the number of ratings, number of citations, and then uh, we look at the entities that collectively uh, contribute to top 33% of the uh, traffic. So that is head entities. And then the entities that collectively contribute 33% uh, in the middle, that is the torso entities, and then the rest are long tail. So as an extreme, if you look at the movie domain, 0.01% uh, of the movies contribute to 33% of the traffic. Here, the traffic is the number of ratings on IMDb. And um, uh, definitely, this uh, uh, follows the power law. Very, very, very long tail. And uh, for DBpedia and um, also DBLP, we do not have such a, a sort of uh, traffic information. So instead, we look at the connections, how many triples we have for each uh, entity. And uh, in such uh, prox uh, approximation, we see that the percentage of long tails dropped to about 85, 86 percent, but still it follows the power law. Okay, so the second enabler is how we ask the questions. We found large language models are actually very good at um, uh, understanding the simple form the factual question. And so um, we ask simple questions, and also we ask for s brief answers. So we would say something like, uh, as few words as possible in your answer, and if you do not know, say unsure. And this actually allows the large language models to basically only give brief, consistent answers uh, when they are sure of the answers. And so we actually ask the large language models to uh, decide by themselves whether their answers are correct when we give them the uh, ground truth and also their own answers. So we have three categories, correct answers, incorrect answers, and unsure. And so uh, related to that, we have three metrics. Accuracy is the percentage of correct answers. Hallucination rate is the percentage of incorrect answers. And the missing rate is basically where they say unsure. 
Okay, so now guess uh, what is the accuracy? Oh, by the way, uh, when we do this uh, by large language models, the metrics are 98% consistent with human labels. Okay, so the accuracy of the large language models on answering those factual questions is about 20%. And as you can see, it is very low. And for Lama, the hallucination rate is 80%, very, very high. And for ChatGPT, by the way, this is Llama 1 and ChatGPT 3.5, uh, the missing rate is high. And also we see that for open domain and uh, overall, uh, we have very similar accuracies. In other words, for open domain and a specific domain, the quality are similar. So are the performance similar to head, torso, tail? And uh, as you can imagine, uh, the performance dropped uh, gradually from head to torso to tail. For long tail, especially like specific domains, is as low as 5%. And even for head, it is not that high, it's about 30%. And even for the best domain, which is movie, uh, the quality for head, that like 600 movies, as I remember, the quality is 50%. So it is still not that high. And the intuition is that large language models needs a lot of training data to learn. And for torso and the long tail, we don't have that much of training data to train the models. So um, the hallucination rate, on the other hand, does not necessarily uh, increase. So sometimes for torso, the hallucination rate uh, is uh, higher the head and the tail. So for head knowledge with a lot of training data, the model knows when it does not know, but for torso, it may not know when it does not know. And for some tail domains, for example, academics, we are at the tail domain, and the accuracy is very low, single digit. Interestingly, uh, for um, had torso tail attributes, not the entities, but the attributes, we observe very similar accuracy. And this is because understanding the attribute meaning is not high, is not hard with the training data. And on the other hand, oftentimes we only have uh, tail attribute information for head entities. So that's kind of why it does not necessarily be low quality uh, answers for tail attributes. So do the normal large language models tricks help? Well, when we increase the model size, as you can see, the quality does not get better because the key is training data instead of the model size. And also when we do instruction tuning, again, it just get higher missing rate, the accuracy does not improve. So what is the next generation of knowledge graph? Unless we have some breakthrough that we can learn knowledge uh, without training, without that much of training data, for a long time, I believe, knowledge graph will still exist. And it will exist, coexist in two forms, the symbolic form as triples in knowledge graphs, and also the neural form in the large language models. The question next is, what kind of knowledge will exist where? And uh, this is an important question because we need to know whether or not we should spend the resource to collect knowledge as we did before or to train the large language models. And here is my uh, sort of prediction. For head entities and also head classes, we need both the embeddings and the symbolic knowledge uh, to uh, to, to represent them. And then for torso and the long tail knowledge, uh, this is where it is very hard to train the model and they can just exist in the knowledge graph. And finally, uh, for the ontology, basically the classes, for some of the, um, some of the like long tail types, for example, product types, the large language models are actually very good at understanding them. So we can just use the embeddings to represent them. 
And so we have two key questions to answer. One is how to infuse the head knowledge into the large language models to enable precise QA for head knowledge, uh, for, for, for those like head entities. Recall that nowadays the answer accuracy is only 30 to 50%. And the second question is, for those torso tail knowledge, how can we seamlessly plug in external knowledge to improve the answer quality? Okay, so now I want to tell you a little bit about my work at Meta. At Meta, we are developing the smart assistants for like uh, the VR devices, Oculus, Quest, and for ribbon stories, the smart glasses, where, which you can use to take photos, to like, um, uh, to, to make phone calls and so on. And uh, comparing with like a normal smart assistants like Alexa and Google Home, uh, when you have smart glasses, you can see through it, so it understands what you are seeing. The input is multimodal, and uh, you could wear it everywhere instead of just putting it on your kitchen uh, table. And so it knows the context such as what is the time, location, what you are doing, and uh, you wear it for a long time, so it knows better about your personal information, uh, your personal habits. And finally, because you wear it everywhere and you can wear it for a long time, you do not necessarily have connection all the time. So sometimes it needs to be on device. And so in addition to the two problems I just mentioned, uh, we are also trying to make all of this multimodal, contextual, and also personalized. Okay, uh, to tell you a bit more, uh, my everyday worries now when we work on the devices is uh, not only those like fancy features, data, but also uh, the physics. Basically, what is the mem memory usage? What is the battery usage? And what is the thermal? We don't want to like answer a question and then the glasses uh, like melt on your face. And so in the past 20 years up to 2021, uh, if I have a dream, the dream is to have like uh, trucks of data coming to me to enrich the knowledge graphs. But recently, uh, if I have a dream, the dream is that everyone has a big nose and could wear a computer. So uh, two takeaways, the three generations of knowledge graphs, entity-based, text-rich, and uh, the future like dual neural knowledge graphs. And um, also to go from rooftop goals to moonshot goals or from the crazy ideas to industry practice, we need to go through feasibility, quality, repeatability, scalability, and ubiquity. So some shameless advertisement for our book and some benchmark data uh, for knowledge uh, integration and knowledge extraction. With all of this, thank you very much, and I would like to take questions. Thank you so much, Luna. I'm thinking of giving you some data, and I might record some of these uh, with the, the, the oh, Raven nice. stories. <laughs> so be aware, if the light is on, I'm recording you. <laughs> So um, thank you again very much. Big round of applause and questions. I, here we go. One question latest when you mentioned ubiquity, shouldn't you have talked about also multilingual, particularly with the text rich knowledge graphs? Yes, that's a great question. So the question is about multilingual uh, for text-rich knowledge graphs. And uh, recall that um, when I mentioned the um, uh, scalability, actually I show these three dimensions. And the one dimension is uh, the different languages. And for Amazon, uh, for as an example, we could have tens to hundreds of languages. And the question is how we can develop one single model to cover all of the different languages. And luckily with the language models, especially large language models, now it is becoming much, much easier. Great question, thank you. I've seen one on the back and then, and then I'll come down.
Thank you. Very, very great talk. Thank you Thank so much. You. I was wondering about what about privacy? That's a great question. And uh, so for privacy, uh, for public knowledge, this is uh, where we worry less about privacy because the data is already public. And we do worry a lot about privacy when we talk about personal knowledge graph. And uh, so taking um, uh, some devices as an example, like uh, the to uh, protect privacy, um, ideally, uh, the personal data only stays on the device. So only you have the access to your personal data. And in the long term, when we want to do personalized large language model, that's where we really face this, um, like, uh, this challenge because uh, just uh, on the devices, we are not able to run the inference of large language models. And so uh, we could, uh, for example, just uh, send embeddings to represent uh, the personal habits to the server. And even this would need some opt-in. So the users should be able to know what kind of personal data are collected and uh, should agree to send whatever data to the server. But there is a lot to consider when we talk about personal knowledge graph and personal, uh, personalize the large language models. And there was a hand here. Yeah. Yeah, so as we see geographies like Europe discussing this idea of um, saying, okay, we're gonna have a European large language model. We're not gonna participate in this larger global large language model. How do you see those kind of um, decisions to, to kind of cut off this flow of data to large language models as affecting the knowledge graph to large language model kind of um, transition or, or interaction? And then to that end, how do you see, um, so like thinking about like a data commons approach to participating in something like a large, a global large language model, um, where, do, where do you see opportunities for, uh, for governance, uh, governments to um, think about value from a shared large language model? So not, not moving to like a European large language model where we're cut off from other um, large language models. Mm, that's a great question. So basically, when we are trying to build a European large language model, uh, basically, what is the connection to the uh, normal, like general large language model, and also uh, what are the practice we need to follow to make it more uh, effective? And uh, honestly, this is the first time I think about this, and I do not necessarily have the best answer for it. And what I could um, uh, imagine is the training data is the key, and basically it is about how we collect training data that best sort of uh, uh, serve the needs for a European large language model. And so that is one. And the second thing is that just as the first question uh, asked uh, about the multimodal, uh, sorry, multilingual, and uh, that is um, uh, more uh, sort of uh, uh, more spelled out for the European countries. And that is another part uh, we need to sort of uh, build uh, cross-lingual uh, uh, training data to connect the different uh, contents from different languages in building this large language model. These are the two things I could think of on foot. Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, if I may rephrase President Kennedy's, uh, rather than ask how can LLMs help knowledge graphs, how can knowledge graphs help L to make better LLMs? And if I may add, can good quality language resources together with knowledge graphs, do you think can help in that? Yeah. This is a great question. And basically, this is about how large language models and LLMs could serve each other. And this comes back to uh, this diagram. And so one thing is large language models cannot learn all of the torso and the long tail knowledge. And uh, how can the knowledge graph uh, sort of serve as external sources or external like plugins 
for large language models to answer any question and to help facilitate uh, like um, uh, decisions. And this is just uh, like a normal, like human beings. We do not remember everything. Instead, when we try to write something, when we try to decide something, we will refer to some external like books, uh, websites, or any other sources to facilitate the uh, decision making, to answer questions, et cetera. And similar here, for large language models, it already sort of encode some of the knowledge, but meanwhile, it needs to uh, sort of uh, refer to some external sources to make better uh, question answering and the conversations. And knowledge graphs is an important source for that. So that's number one. Number two, uh, a lot of the knowledge graphs, or even like a common sense knowledge, they can serve as some like training data as well. So we have tried to sort of try to uh, use all of the knowledge graph to train the large language models, and it didn't work well. Um, but for head knowledge, that's where we have a lot of uh, sort of data uh, to facilitate it, uh, to, to, to help the training, and we can dis uh, distill those head knowledge into large language models. And so hopefully, uh, the large language models, when they need to answer popular factual information, provide popular factual information, it does not need to always go to external sources, but just to answer those questions directly. This is, again, just like human beings, for something that is either our expertise or some like a common knowledge, we do not need to like look up the dictionary to answer the question. And I do want to talk about a third possibility. We have been hearing about large uh, like Gen AI personas. Those personas, for example, uh, the uh, large language model mimicking that's let's say Taylor Swift, and she should know more about music or at least the country music. And this is another place where we can sort of. Uh, uh, instill some particular knowledge in some particular domains to the large language models and to better uh, sort of serve um, uh, users' need to make it more interesting to interact with the, the large language models. I hope this answers your question. One last question before the coffee break, if we have one. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, as Meta did open source uh, their uh, React framework, we are all sitting here and want to do th things, smart things with data, so for that we need tools. So is Meta also thinking about uh, open sourcing their graph uh, technology? Um, so uh, that's a great question. So whether or not we are open sourcing our graph technology. And um, uh, I do not uh, currently know open sourcing of our technology on this yet, because this is still under development. And uh, it is still like a so new technology that we are developing in research and we are also trying to put into production. And uh, once we see success, yes, we will consider that. Okay, a big round of applause for Luna. Thank you okay, ever thank so you. much. And as a, as a small gift from the conference, we planted a tree in your name, and you can have it in 25 years. And here's the certificate. It's true, it's yours in 25 years. Thank you ever again, and please uh, reach out to Luna during the, go the day, the coffee break, uh, and so on.